Okay. So, as you'll see, the outline says great themes from Genesis through Revelation. This is what we're going to take up for the next, we'll see, approximately 12 weeks, I would guess. What I want you to see as we keep going through this is how we develop more and more themes and how those themes continue through the Bible as we progress through it. So they start in, 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 in Revelation, where we're going to start tonight in the first chapter, I mean in Genesis, in the first chapter, and they'll end up eventually, you'll see, in the book of Revelation. And they weave all the way through. It gives you a way to understand what any one section or what any one story that you read in the Bible means. We were reminded that there are 66 books in the Bible. There are 40 different authors of the 66 books written over approximately 2,500 years of time. And yet it's one integrated whole. And that, of course, speaks of the Holy Spirit, who caused it to be integrated in a way that it's one master message. It's a story. It's a story with themes. Okay? So we're going to develop the themes of the story. Now, you will see here, the first, there are ten originally paintings. We call them panels. Okay? This is the first one you'll see on the computer. We'll, and I will be talking about the symbolism of the panel and filling it in with what's going on. But it depicts symbolically each thing that we're going to talk about. So there will be ten different panels. This is the first one for this week. This was the, the brainchild, as it were, of a woman who I grew up knowing, <coughs> who painted these and originated these, and she was a mentor to me. And uh, I think it's a brilliant idea, and I hope I can halfway do it justice. So, as in any story, we must begin with the beginning. And the beginning is in Genesis 1. But it actually begins before Genesis 1. Because there are certain things that occurred even before Genesis 1 1. One of those things, of course, that occurred was eternity in the past. There was then no physical universe. There were no stars. There were no planets. There were no solar systems. There were no angels. There were no people. But rather, there was God. God, of course, when, when Moses is confronted with God, he says, who shall I say sent me in Exodus chapter 3? And God, from his own voice, says, I am that I am. This is the I am before all history, before everything. At some point, there becomes another event which occurs. We don't know exactly at what point it is, but that point would be the creation of the angelic realm. Let's look at a few verses in here about angels. Let's turn first to, to the book of Job, probably maybe our oldest book in the entire Old Testament. Let's go to Job, and we're going to go to chapter 38. And... We're going to look at verse 7. It says, speaking of the creation, he's, he's going through and talking about all these aspects of the creation he made in the 38th chapter. Like Gary said, it's, uh, it's the 77 science questions of God, okay? None of which, either none of whom Job or his friends could possibly answer one of them. In verse 7 it says, he talks about when the morning stars, and that word in Hebrew refers to angelic beings, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, that is B'nai Elohim, sons of God, shouted for joy. So we see here references to the fact that God created an angelic realm. We don't know how many angels he created. We don't, we don't have a number on that. 
but he created an angelic realm. It's interesting because God, being infinite and personal, creates beings then who are also, in a certain way, infinite, that is eternal in that sense, not infinite in the sense that God is, but eternal and yet personal. Okay? Also, we then go to the next event, and that is the specific creation of one person that we know about quite well. Turn to the book of Ezekiel. We're told here about the person of Lucifer. Ezekiel chapter 28. And here we find some very important information about this person named Lucifer. Starting in verse, we'll start in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation over, quote, the king of Tyre. You're going to find real quickly that he isn't really talking about the physical king of Tyre because of what's being said. And, and say to him, thus says the Lord God, so here's how he describes this being. You have the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Ruby, topaz, diamonds, beryl, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and emerald. And the gold and the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. Bottom line, you were absolutely gorgeous. Created in utter perfection, you had everything. The number one created angelic being that we call, we called then Lucifer. Oh. He says, he says, they were prepared in you. You were the anointed cherub who covers. That is, he was created to literally guard the throne of God and the presence of God himself. And I placed you there, God says. You were on the holy mountain of God. And you walked in the midst of the stones of fire, which seems to be a reference to other created angelic beings that they're referring to in this context as the other stones of fire. You were blameless literally means righteous, in your ways from the day that you were created, and now the story changes. Until. <laughs> Underline until. Until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, which seems to be he led praise of God in heaven with the angels. This was his trade. Okay, By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. So in other words, he wasn't content to be the worship leader, but rather he wanted to be worshipped. Okay? That was the beginning of the, of the sin that led to violence that was in him. He says, therefore I have cast you as profane from the holy mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire, that is, cast out from those other angelic beings there. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. In other words, he was kicked out of a very intimate level of heaven at that point no longer having access to it. Okay? So this is the beginning of the person that we originally was called Lucifer. We call him Satan after he becomes, after he sins. And again, what was his sin? He could not accept being a created one, even though he was the number one created one. He wanted to be God himself. This is the sin that leads to all other sins, as you're going to see as we move down the story. Now, so we have the creation of the angels. Thirdly, as I said, we have the rebellion of Satan. There's another passage about his rebellion. 
that I think is worth looking at briefly, and that's in Isaiah. So turn to Isaiah, and we want to go to Isaiah chapter 14. And we learn some other very important information about this person originally called Lucifer and now called Satan. Starting in verse 11 of Isaiah 14. Again, speaking of the worship leader status originally. Your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you, and worms are your covering. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, literally Lucifer in Hebrew, okay? Son of the dawn, you've been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. That's an important point. And you're going to see as we go on, Satan was not content to just sin himself, but there are other things that he also incited. Very quickly, he incites this event that we're going to go into next week in the third chapter of Genesis that we call the fall, or the sin of Adam and Eve. And then before not very long, he is now in control of what goes on in all the nations of the earth as they progress. And he's doing his business and his strategy to weaken and undermine and create havoc and misery and death in all of them as he can. We see here then five things that become the essence of his sin, starting in verse 13. But you said in your heart, number one, I will ascend to heaven. Number two, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, that is, the other angelic beings. Number three, I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recess of the north. In other words, he wants the throne. Okay? Fourth, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and fifth, I will make myself like the Most High God. This is the arrogance of this being that led him to the sin that occurred. Now, all beings, clearly, we see from what we're, we, we read here, are given free will. There are no robots in God's realm. Everyone has free will. Every being had free will. Yes, Jack. I, I always heard that the angels really were like robots. They didn't have free will. Well, they had, they had to have free will yeah. because, number one, here's the foremost of them that expresses his will in a very negative way and breaks away from God. And secondly, there another event occurs, which, of course, we it's referred to actually in Revelation 12, and that is, he didn't leave by himself. A third of all the angels went with him. They all chose their way also. But they don't have free will to go back no. and get salvation. No. There is no regeneration for the angels. Because angels can't die, and there's no way back. And as you're going to see as we go on, there's a reason for death. There's a purpose in death as evil spreads. You're going to see the theme of death. We'll, we'll, we'll get more to that next week. Yes? Yeah. Did, <clears throat> according to this, then, <clears throat> Satan came onto the earth well after creation. Yes. I mean, yes, he did, because creation of the physical world hasn't even occurred probably at this point. I mean, it's hard to know the exact timing, but certainly the creation of the angels had to be well before, in my opinion, the, cre the creation of the physical universe. At the point of the creation of the angels, there is no physical universe. Okay? Right. There's I a spiritual universe, and there's spiritual beings in it, God and the angels, but there's no physical universe. Okay? And in a second, we're going to get to the next part. And that's the creation of the physical universe. Well, the, the confusing part to me is that it says that um, something about the nations here, that that uh, you have weakened yeah. the nations. He's talking about his future his future strategy once he is then, once man is created and he's now 
foiled and fooled mankind into sinning also. Then his strategy is weakening the nations, creating havoc. Well, what I was trying to do is, in my mind, try to place when, when this actually did occur. Was it after the time that Adam and Eve's children sinned? Yes. Weakening the nations, yes, because you had to have the development of enough people to have the nations. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Correct. So that, so then Jesus himself then dealt with the sin of Adam's children. Sure. Jesus, I mean, Jesus was there the whole time. As we read in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, who did the literal creating of the entire physical universe? Jesus. He was the author and creator. Okay? Now, notice something, a theme that's very important here. Okay? We're, going to look in, we're looking at themes. We're going to summarize some themes as we get towards the end of this evening. That is, originally there was one will in the universe. That was the will of God. When there became a second will in the universe, everything went downhill very rapidly. The whole drama and the history of the tragedy of human history, because I think it's fair to say that what we're seeing here and what we're going to develop is the tragedy of human history. Human history is filled with cycles and cycles and cycles of tragedy. But the beginning point is because it cannot work where there's more than one will. At the point at which there's two, the whole design falls apart and, and becomes a misery on the, people, the very people that are in it. Okay? You see the tragedy in this. You see the tragedy unfolding. You see the tragedy of the fall with Adam and Eve. You see the tragedy of, of Cain killing Abel. You see that, I mean, you go on and on, and the stories that go on are the recreation of tragedy over and over and over. You know? Now, people will ask, and they, and they often will ask the question. So let me just say it here. Okay? They ask, where did evil come from? And we just answer that question. And number two, they perpetually ask, how can a good God allow horrible things to happen in the world if he's such a good God. You also have the answer to that in what we just said. If God, if, if man is a free agent, and if the angels were free agents, then they had the right to choose. But implied in the choice is that you can choose badly. The history of the universe, literally, of humanity and the universe, of the world, from this moment until the very end, where the new heavens and the new earth are created, is the story of how choosing not God's way leads to worse and worse and worse events until it comes to its terminal point called the seven years of the tribulation on the earth. That's the story of the tragedy in its many forms. It comes to a culmination. At the end, where there is that culmination, everyone in the universe, that is the devil, his angels, God's angels and all human beings are going to come to a conclusion. This experiment did not go well. <laughs> and no one will ever do it again. The conclusion of not choosing God's will ends badly. And that's part of the great story. Yes? If where the angels were perfect, I understand that you chose evil. Where did that evil come from? The evil is the alternate of God's will. Notice even, in the, and we'll get to it next week, notice even talking about the tree. There's a tree. It isn't the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Good and evil are on the same tree. Okay. So it's either the tree of life. God created the tree. Yes, it's either the tree of life, okay. life with God, life in His will, or it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you don't have the tree of life, and if you don't choose God's life, then the alternate reality is what we call evil. So her question was, which I agree. So God created evil then? No, God did not create evil. God created free will, which had the potential for evil. He didn't make evil occur. 
says he created everything, not nothing was made, but God created it. Can God do evil? No way. God does not James do tells us clearly that he is not the author yes, of, of evil. 47, something says God created yeah. good animals. Well, so I, I just did. I would say he, he allowed it by the issue of free will choice. Mm-hmm. Okay. And again, some of these things are difficult to wrap our mind totally around because we're finite and trying to understand eternal things entirely becomes a loop that we can't quite get our mind around. <laughs> There's a point at which we kind of go, hmm. yeah. all right, it's like free will, deep predestination and free will. It's a, it's a loop that you can't quite completely put your mind around. Now, you'll see in this, there are keys to these panels. That is, you'll see that the higher ground, as you go along the panels, everything that's upper always represents God's kingdom or God's influence. Okay? The lower ground always represents Satan's influence or the kingdom of the earth or the counterfeit world system that we call by the Greek word the cosmos. It literally means the counterfeit mirror image world system. Mirror image is a very good word set of words to describe what the world system is like. So the light color is God's good, and the dark color is Satan's evil influence. Okay? So in the beginning, we have here, in panel one, we have the the original creation of the world, which we're going to talk about next, on the left side in the middle. It is a jewel. It is created in perfection. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It works perfectly. Perfect ecosystem, perfect topography, perfect everything, okay? We see up here in the upper part the world today. Notice its influence in the shadow. It's influenced by the satanic forces. Down at the bottom is a representation on the globe of the Middle East, God's real estate. God's real estate is the Middle East. He chose it. We didn't choose it. He chose it. Chose it. Okay? And that's where a huge amount of the action takes place in the world, as we're going to see. Now, the creation of the physical universe. You're going to have to tolerate for a few minutes one of my science talks. Okay? I'm sorry, but there's no way to get around it. Earplugs. Earplugs. Now, go back to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read the first nine verses, and I'm going to tell you that they're very difficult without some understanding of science and literally of physics to understand what they really mean. But I'll read them, and you tell me if you understand what he's saying. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it be let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below from the waters which were above, which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. Now, is it clear to you? Not exactly. Okay. So we have some, some important questions to ask. For instance, what does he mean by that the earth was formless and void? What does he mean that there was darkness upon the surface of the deep? What is the surface of the deep? Okay. What is the surface of the waters? Uh, Where did the light come from? And uh, 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 what is the expanse that's in the midst of the waters? What does he mean about separating the waters from above from the waters which are below? All these are important questions. Now, Yeah, we'll go back for a second. Mm-hmm. 
All right. Now, I don't know how well you can see that. I don't know how to make it a whole lot bigger necessarily. Um, so we'll have to do the best we can. Now, what God started with is one massive, huge ball of water. Okay? That's what he begins with. And that ball, it, it, it is, it, they approximate it by estimates of people that do physics, particularly Dr. Humphreys, who you're going to see in a second here, because I'm going to show you a little video clip. They estimate the ball of water that God started with was approximately two light years in diameter. Now think about it, two light years in diameter. That is one huge amount of water. Now, what we know, because of what we know about physics, is that when you have that much mass in one place, it begins to collapse. It literally falls in on itself because of massive, unbelievable gravitational force. It collapses on itself until a point at which the forces of its collapse are outweighed by the heat and the nuclear fission and fusion which occur because it's forcing molecules together in the atoms closer and closer and closer, okay? What eventually happens is a massive explosion, what we call or what physicists call a white hole. Now, at that point, we would agree with cosmologists about, quote, the Big Bang. We're not agreeing what the source of the Big Bang was, because they say it was hydrogen. God says it was water. Okay? But that is indeed a Big Bang which occurs. At which point, everything starts to be blown outward. Okay? The most remote thing blown, being blown at the fastest rate begin to expand. Those that are inside more going second. Okay, and finally, after a long enough period of time, you find that there was a core left. Okay, that core, the Bible says, recalls, and the earth was formless and void. You have at the core the primitive earth. The primitive earth now has all of the atomic um, periodic table. All of the progressive atoms have formed, so you have 103 or whatever elements now in that core earth okay now what it, this the, the the word for uh for raquia or for expanse in verse 1 6 genesis 1 6 it says then god said let there be an expanse it's the word raquia in hebrew it means something which is stamped down an extended surface it's also a word firmament can be used there. And what it literally means is God's taking the substance and he's manufacturing out of it a fabric. That fabric is what we call interstellar space. Now, people think of interstellar space and they say, oh, yeah, that's that part up there that's vacant. It is not vacant. Okay? It has gravity waves in it. It has atoms in it. It has dust in it. It has water vapor in it. It has all kinds of electromagnetic forces in it. It's filled with a certain type of activity. Not an activity that we easily see, obviously, from our position. But it is literally a membrane. Okay? Now, let me add one more thing. You take this massive, unbelievable ball of water. Okay? Einstein had this wonderful little equation that we all heard about. It's called E equals MC squared. Therefore, he said that energy is equal to mass times the square of the speed of light. Now, there's a lot of implications of Einstein's formula. One of them is that that which that which distorts space is mass. Okay? When you have mass enough in one area, it distorts space. 
it bends it. It can bend it to the point, as a matter of fact, that the two edges that are bent can meet each other. Therefore, you can end up beginning and ending in the same place. That kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Okay. Mass also distorts time. Now, we know that's the case because we've done lots of scientific experiments. We've put atomic clocks at sea level and atomic clocks at 5,280 feet in Denver, Colorado, and we let them run for a year, and lo and behold, what happens at the end of the year? We compare them. The one at 5,280 feet in Denver ran slower than the one on sea level. Why? Because it's just a little bit higher in relationship to the core of the Earth, the very center of the mass of the Earth, than the one at sea level. But it's a measurable distance. Now, if you take an enormous amount of mass, okay, an unbelievable amount of mass, it's going to distort space and it's going to distort time. Therefore, at the point of the, of the center of the mass or in the mass itself, Time will run very slowly compared to outside of it, that area that's been extended out because of the explosion. So you have two different experiences of time. Where the mass is very concentrated, time is slow. Where the mass is much less concentrated, mass is faster. Which explains a very important thing. How is it the Bible can claim that the earth was created in six days? And yet we see evidence that there's, quote, billions of years in the universe around. Mm -hmm. That's the explanation. Because it's the distortion of time in the creation process. So if you were standing on the earth, or what becomes the earth, it, you would have experienced six different 24-hour periods called the days of creation. But if you would have been out at the, at the edge of the event horizon, which was blown out way from you, and you had a clock, your clock would be reading millions and billions of years, not six days. Does that make any sense to you? I know this is a physics lecture a little bit, but I want you to try to understand what some of these things mean. So the, the, the rakia, the expanse, then becomes that part that's blown out, okay, that is extended out, which we call the fabric of space. That's a layer. That's the waters that are above, as it's referred to in the verse. Remember, separating the waters from below, which is from the waters that are above. Okay. Now, ma'im, the word ma'im, of course, means waters. We talked about it. It can only mean one thing. Water. And a lot of it. It's plural. So we talked about this massive sphere. We talked about the white hole, the big bang. We talked about the residual core. Now, the waters that are below, that were separated from the waters which are above, the lower waters become interstellar space and the place for the planets and the stars and eventually in the lowest level, the atmosphere of the Earth. The Earth cools and, of course, eventually the water that's left condenses into a certain amount of liquid water. That God forms it takes the mineral base of what's left, forms the basin of the oceans, the mountain ranges, and then places in it the liquid water, which become the seas, the lakes, the streams, etc. So now we eventually have it the center. So interestingly enough, the Bible says, contrary to science, that literally the earth is the center of the universe. Ironic, isn't it? Say that again. The Contrary to what science says, the Bible says that the earth indeed is the center of the universe. It all started at the core on the earth, the primitive earth, and everything expanded out from it. Okay? Now, like I said, the, the, the layer is finally cool. Now, I'm not going to try to get, there's a lot more that could be said, and I'm not going to try to get into the complexity of it. All right, because there's a lot of potential complexity. But one thing I want to mention is this. The issue of cosmology, that is the study of the origin of the universe, has been debated for a long, long period of time. 
Science, secular scientists have their own version of the Big Bang. Ironically and interestingly, their version gets older every decade. It does. I mean, how many of you were in high school in the 1960s, and how old did they say the universe was then? I remember it clearly in high school biology. They said maybe two to three billion years. Okay? How old do they say the universe is now? 300 billion. No, not that. They're, they're talking about 12 to 15 wow. billion years. Okay. But about every 10 or 15 years, interestingly enough, the Earth gets billions of years older. Why? Why? Why do they conclude that? Because they discover other planets that they found in space? And because they know that their view of evolution requires massive amounts of time. And therefore, somehow the Earth keeps getting older and older, and the universe keeps getting older and older all the time, because it accommodates their view. All right? Now, let's talk about the chance that this all occurred. And I'm going to break this down. I'm going to break this down somewhat simplistically. Okay? Uh, simplistically, yeah. <laughs> simplistically compared to the unbelievable complexity of this happening by chance. So here's an example, okay? What's the chance this occurred by chance? If you take a string of 347 beads, half of them are black, half of them are white, okay? The, the, the string falls apart, so the beads go all over the place. And what you, what you want is you're trying with these two different colors, two different types, to go through all the possible creations by chance so that with these beads, okay, that you could then have a Morse code version of Genesis 1-1. In the beginning was, okay, in Morse code. How many possible combinations of beads would you have to go through by chance for that to occur? Well, based on statistics, okay, scientific notation, you have here the number. The number is, would be uh, two types. 2 to the minus 347th power. Another way to put that in scientific notation, I wrote down here, is 2.8669 times 10 to the minus 104th power. That's how many tries you would have to have for this thing to occur by chance. Now, let me give you, because, you know, it's a little hard to wrap your mind around 10 to the minus 104th power. So let me give you some some other ways to, to, to view this. 10 to the 18th seconds. 10 to the 18th. That's a whole lot different than 104th. Okay? Equals 15 billion years. Okay? Uh, 10 to the 66th is the number of atoms that scientists estimate are in our galaxy. 10 to the 80th is estimated number of subatomic particles in the universe. And mathematically, 10 to the minus 50th power is considered to be the number for mathematical absurdity. In other words, from then on, you might as well just say infinite. So, and 10 to the minus 50 is not really close to 10 to the minus 104th. It's many, many, many exponential numbers beyond it. So, even in our simple example of 347 beads, it is, there isn't enough time in the entire universe, nor particles, nor subatomic particles, for this to ever occur. Okay? So, this is a design. This is certainly nothing that could ever occur by chance. Now, I want to illustrate, because we're talking about themes. Me. Yes? So, the chance of the uh, universe by chance by chance is yes. is an astronomical number that is so fabulously high that we have no even way to put our mind around how big it is. Uh -huh. And however, scientists say that it's by chance. That's what they say. 
But they have to really extend their idea of the universe being 15 billion years old. They ain't even begun. <laughs> I would ask them to write it down and show it to them. Yeah, absolutely. Time. Just write, just take time to, it'd take them so many years just to write the zeros behind it. They'd never get done with that. Oh, yeah. it's, it's a massive number. Okay, Robert, is this okay with your, this fit in with what you know? He's over there calculating. Yeah, oh, that's right. He's, he's got his calculator out. He's working on his pad right now. He did want a second opinion. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's a good idea. Now, let's talk about the theme of water. We're talking about themes, okay? Look at F in your outline. God uses water to create the physical universe. We just discussed that. God uses water to judge a corrupted world. Genesis 6, verse 17. What happens to the world? God says, I will bring a flood of water upon the world. God uses water to preserve the Jews out of Egypt and judge a satanically inspired strategy of Pharaoh to destroy them. Exodus 14, verses 26 and 28. And indeed, it was a satanically inspired strategy. It wasn't just Pharaoh had a bad day. Okay, It was his effort to destroy because of the promise that we're going to read about here next week in Genesis 3.15. Jesus begins his ministry with baptism of water. Matthew 3.13. Water becomes a sign or portion in Jesus' death. Why don't we turn to that one? You may not know exactly what I'm talking about there, but it's very interesting what he says. It's John 19. And we're going to look at verse 34. We'll, we'll, start with, we'll start with 32. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man and the other man who was crucified with him. One on each side, remember? Why did they break their legs? Partly. Yeah. Partly. But remember, we're talking about the Jews want this done. Okay, why? Exactly. Because they cannot allow a crucifixion to intrude onto the Sabbath. And so it's like, we got to get this thing over with. And so they break their legs so that they can't raise themselves up. They suffocate rapidly. They die. It was all about the Sabbath. Okay. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, which, by the way, fulfills a number of prophecies, not the least of which is in Isaiah, that not a bone would be broken. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately there came out blood and water. So water is also a component even in Jesus' own death. Finally, but certainly not exclusively, we see water as the river in New Jerusalem. Revelation 22, 1 through 2. Okay? It flows through the middle of the New Jerusalem, and it supplies water, quote-unquote, for the nations. Okay? Just like the Tree of Life supplies healing for the nations. Now, I want to show you one more step of this, too, how this all ties together as a theme. You're in John now, so go to Second Peter, chapter three, starting in verse five. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to start in three instead of five. Second Peter, three, please. Three, starting in three. Know this first of all, that in the last days. Okay, that means those days right before his return. Uh, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. In other words, they have a motive here in what they're going to do. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of the creation. In other words, 
he's telling us that the Laodicean church age is not going to be looking for the return of Christ, but rather they're going to be mocking those who believe in the return of Christ to the earth. Where is he? Uh, it's been a couple thousand years now. This guy's not showing up again. Where is he? But notice what Peter says, starting in verse 5. For when they maintain this, it escapes notice that the word of God, by the word of God, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Peter didn't get that wrong. He read Genesis. He knew the truth that's taught here. Okay? Through which the world at the time was destroyed, being flooded with water, but the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So, he ties it all together. Peter is telling us the theme of water starts as early as the creation, goes through the flood, and goes all the way through to the very end. It's a theme that carries through. All right? So when you look at water as a subject, it has an importance. It's going to tell you certain things. It's going to show up through the, as a theme through the, through the rest of the Bible. Also, it's interesting. I just thought about this today. Verse 8, you know, I was talking about that where there's a place of enormous mass, time slows down. Notice verse 8. And do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. That's exactly what we just got done saying in a scientific sense. Okay? That time is distorted in certain situations. Okay? And it was certainly in the creation situation. Now, I want to show you something here. It's a little... Uh, this is just a diagram of what I was talking about, the massive ball of water, the surface of the deep, that would be the edge, the leading edge of that ball of water, you know, uh, the fact that it's two, two light years in diameter, uh, and of course the, the expansion that, that occurs. But I want to show you one other thing here that I think is kind of interesting. It's a, it's a nice video explanation for what happens when you have a lot of mass in one place. This is Dr. Humphreys. Let me see if I got that. Yeah, it should be okay. And he's going to explain this. So listen to this. Today, the distortion is minor compared to the time of the year. And the passage of time varies by just a few percent of what you wish to be present. But the cosmos is expanding, and in the past, the universe was smaller. Very compact and smaller. Yes. The red shift of light from distant sources is a direct evidence of the expansion. Light sources emit small wavelets of light called photons. Light is literally stretched out as it passes through space, which is also being stretched out as the cosmos expands. The farther light travels in space, the longer and redder it becomes. Besides the evidence for observation, Einstein's equations of relativity also predict the expansion of space. So beyond the scientific evidence for the expansion of the universe, there are 17 verses in the Bible such as this. It is he who sits above the vault of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent of dwelling. That's the rock Isaiah 40, 21, 22. Or this one, Jeremiah 10, 12. It is he who made the earth by his power. Who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding, he has stretched out the heavens. Stretched out. In the beginning, when the universe was smaller than it is today, all the matter in the cosmos was closer together. 
that caused an enormous depression in the fabric of space. On the Earth, near the center of the universe and deep within the depression, time slowed down. During creation week on Earth, time passed as just ordinary days. But near the edge of the observable universe, during the same period, billions of years of physical processes occurred. Thus, the most distant starlight could easily traverse the vast expanse of the cosmos from the edge to the center in just a few short Earth days. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. During the ordinary days of creation week on earth, Light from distant galaxies traversed billions of light years of space from the edge of the observable universe to the center. God created the cosmos such that on the sixth day of creation, when Adam looked up into the vast depths of the heavens, he could see all the splendor of God's handiwork. Differential rate of time in my supposed creation of oh, the stuff right there. At any rate, you know, the, 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 the universe, the world, the universe did not occur by chance. Now, let's summarize some of the themes we've found just so far in Genesis 1. We have the theme of water, which you look at it to some extent. We have the theme that there are two universes, not one. The first universe is the spiritual universe, when the, when the angels were created, the, the universe that God exists in. Later, there's the creation of the physical universe, the one that we live in also. There are two types of created beings. There are angelic beings, and there are human beings. And again, as we go on and see the themes, you're going to see Angelic beings keep showing up and interacting with human beings because they have a purpose as messengers of, of God's will. We have the reality of the two wills, as I said, God's will and any other will. And the development of that problem, being Lucifer's fall, became what we call evil and sin. We have two different but related images. We have the image of God, and then we have the creation of man in the image of God, a physical manifestation also of God's image in human form. We have two basic elements of true humanity. Okay? Not three, not four, two, male and female. That's the design. There isn't any other design that works in the creation. We have the theme of blessing. Okay? That is, what did God say after every day of creation? It was good. It was good. Okay? We have the theme of blessing. At the fall, the blessing starts to become a curse. Now we have the theme of cursings which we'll see in Genesis 3. We have the theme of the originally designed good, which at the fall becomes evil. Okay? Now, one other thing I want to mention to you that I, I should have mentioned at the beginning. Remember, in the days of creation, it says an evening and morning, day one. Evening and morning, day two. Why is it he doesn't say morning and evening? Why in that order? Well, it really helps in this case to go back to the Hebrew. Because the word evening and the word morning 
The word evening is the word Erev, and the word morning is the word Bokar. And they mean something more than just day and night. The idea of Erev is something that is vague, something that's unformed, something that's shadowy. It's like nighttime. You can't see the images clearly. Okay? Bokar is the opposite. It means something that has been formulated clearly, a clear image, a clear thing, a precision. So basically, this is the process by which God creates through the six days of creation. He takes an original thing, and through the day of creation, he formulates each one of those things more specifically until it ends up in its intended form. True of the animal kingdom, true of the plant kingdom, and eventually true of humanity. Okay? So he takes the original unformed thing, and then over that day of creation, whatever that day he's working on, whether it's the stars or whatever it is, he makes that well-formed, well-designed final product. That's why it's Erev to Bokar. Okay? It's the process by which he goes through. So, now, your assignment for next week. We're starting next week, which we will not get to in one week, because we're going to try to cover chapters 2 through 6 of Revelation. Not of Revelation, of Genesis. Genesis. Ah, okay, of Genesis. There's a lot of information in those chapters. Very critical information to the rest of the Bible. But your assignment, should you accept it, as a mission possible, I hope you will, is I want you to read through Genesis 2, Genesis 3, Genesis 4, Genesis 5, and Genesis 6, and I want you to write down any themes you see. What are the themes you see? <coughs> and then, as we go through them, and it probably, I'm going to guess it's going to take us two weeks to go through those. Those next two. The next, the next outline is a double outline. You get two pages. Then we're going to identify all those themes, and we're going to see how they relate to the future. How does the theme start in Genesis? How does it relate to a story in the future? What's its fulfillment? Okay? And I think you're going to see a lot of themes in the next four chapters, next four or five chapters of Genesis. But I want you to read them and try to see if you can come up with some themes. Okay? And then we'll go through it and we'll see what all those themes are and how they apply then to everything that's going to come after them. I think the next five chapters of Genesis are the absolute core of some of the most important themes in the entire Bible. It's spread out through all the rest of what's written in the Bible. So, yes, Jan. You know, I can't help thinking when you were talking about Satan and he fell when all the angels to worship and praise him. You know, that's what the angels do to Jesus. Yes. And we will worship him too. Satan and yeah. Jesus too. Isn't it interesting? That because of Satan's need to become God, quote unquote, we see the expression of that in the human sense in all idolatry, okay? And eventually, even at the end of the age, we see the expression of it in transhumanism. What is it that's offered through the transhumanist agenda, they say? You can become eternal. That's the ultimate goal, to rearrange the human genome so that there is an aging so that you can become eternal. You also can become the God. In fact, exactly. And exactly. You, it, instead of man saying, I'm the creation, it's man now taking the devil's part and saying, no, I'm going to be the creator. I'm going to change the design into what I think it can be. And that's why... If those days hadn't been shortened, there would have been no life on the earth. Not normal life, not the originally designed life at least. So we're going to see how this all fits together as we, as we go on. These, like I said, these next four or five chapters are going to 
huge number of very important things. Other question? Other comment? What do you mean make it simpler? I was going to say something simpler. I do need you to cover the law of probability on woodpeckers. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. You can do or, it. I know or you can. just one protein molecule would be good. Right, right. One protein molecule. Okay, let's go ahead. You know what it makes me? It makes me. I know God is huge and infamous, and um, it makes me feel like one of those two or three, you know, Microsoft. Not a but here's what you're going to see next week when we start in chapter 2 and 3, okay? And that is, God designed human beings as being fabulously important. He designed us in a special way with a unique genome, okay? And he designed a physical earth for us, gave us authority over that earth, over all the plant and animal kingdom, to rule and reign on it. We literally were given the authority to be rulers over the planet he created. And to procreate. And to procreate in it and to create, create other life from the originally designed life that he designed. In comes the jealousy of Satan. He can't procreate. And it wasn't done for him. So we have the story of the fall. And he made such a mess, and he did try. He did. So, yes. It's amazing how science says man is getting smarter. It started out as this cave creature, and we finally decided to stand upright, and here we are. But the first man was created in God's image. Yes. Perfect. Everything was like it was supposed to be. So if you look at it, we're actually getting dumber. Well, and it's further, yeah. and further away from well, well, some of us. Well, <laughs> genetic <laughs> mutations are 99.9% .9 fatal. You understand that? What? You're, you're saying genetic? Genetic mutations, as mutations. you study genetics, genetic mutations, a change in a gene transcript, whatever the genetic mutation is, okay? <laughs> is 99.9% .9 fatal to the organism. Known fact. No biologist will dispute that, that statement seriously. But what is it that they conclude in evolution? That through the process of an enormously failed lethal procedure, you get increasingly more sophisticated organisms, beings. How's that work? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't work. When I was giving Tim a bad time about the woodpecker, when he was teaching this many years ago, he went through the process of a woodpecker has a special shock absorber in the brain. Hitting the tree trunk, their brain would literally crash against the skull and die. And then he would go, how many woodpeckers had to die before they figured out the <laughs> shock absorber thing? Right. They needed a new design system. Yeah. Too many dead woodpeckers, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, when you start to study these, these things, the, the, the idea that, that life could have come about by chance over time is an absolute statistical impossibility. You know? It's just impossible. And, and, you know, scientists don't want to address that fact. They still have their faith issue. But we believe it. <laughs> Over enough time. So if the Earth is the center of things, what's the purpose of the other planets? Somehow, just, I mean, maybe it's the same purpose as the star systems. You know, isn't it interesting that we see in Psalm 19 and in many other places of the Old Testament, that God designed the constellations in an exact way to give a message, to teach a story, the, what we call the gospel of stars, the Maseroth. Mm -hmm. You know, everything he did has a purpose to it. And we don't necessarily know all the purposes yet. Some of them we know, some of them we don't know. 
Maybe those planets are made to keep the Earth in orbit. Well, you mean you have a gravitational balance in a solar system. You have all kinds of different dynamics of the solar system. It's actually quite precise. Uh, so, are we the only experiment then? I mean, would would have our Lord tried this on other planets in the, in the universe? We have no evidence that that's true. There, there's there's nothing I, I I don't think there's anything in the text of the scripture to say that's true. I think we are it. it. We are the design. We are the story. We have the tragedies, and the story is going to end up concluding eventually in the right way. One of the things we're going to start next week we talk about starting in Genesis two and three is you're going to start to see the development of satanic strategies. There are many, many, many of them, and they weave their way through the stories. One of the first ones after the fall, one of the next satanic strategies, Cain and Abel. Okay? The killing of the of the heir. Okay? Or the attempt to kill the heir so that there could not be an heir. Remember, in Genesis 3.15, Satan pretty much understood what God said to him. He said, there's going to be a seed it's going to eventually come. It's going to bruise your head. He's going to take your power away. Messiah. Okay? So Satan has done everything all the way through history with all the people of God to try to prevent that from occurring. There's a scene that goes right all the way to the day that Christ is born on the earth. And at age two, what happens? They try to kill him again. Okay? You can't let the error occur. So, this is all the development of these themes. So, anyway, this is the beginning place. We'll move on. So, why don't, Mike, could you close us in prayer? Sure can. Heavenly Father, um, again, I'm excited that we're on the brink of a new year. Um, I know that you have many, many things ahead of us, some for the good and some definitely for the bad. We know that you have given Satan the power on this earth to do devious things and to involve us in those devious things. So, Lord, tonight, I would like to ask you, please, to step in our lives here and the Christian and the fellow believers throughout the world to stay strong in the faith and face this new year with more aggressive ability to witness to the fallen because only through that will that bring you closer and closer to us mm -hmm. so in your precious name we want to give you thanks for this this new insight that we're going through through Tim and we we ask that you'll give him additional strength and some additional burden on him to do these things mm -hmm. And we just pray that you'll give him the strength and the enlightenment to enlighten us. Lord. So in your precious name, I want to thank you for a very blessed night, Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm.